Part One, Propositions Six to Ten of the Ethics by Spinoza. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ethics by Benedict de Spinoza, translated by R. H. M. Els. Part One, Propositions Six to Ten. Proposition six. One substance cannot be produced by another substance. Proof. It is impossible that there should be in the universe two substances with an identical attribute, that is, which have anything common to them both. Proposition two. And, therefore, proposition three, one cannot be the cause of the other, neither can one be produced by the other. Quod erat demonstrandum. Corollary. Hence, it follows that a substance cannot be produced by anything external to itself. For in the universe nothing is granted, save substances and their modifications, as appears from axiom 1 and definitions 3 and 5. Now, by the last proposition, substance cannot be produced by another substance. Therefore, it cannot be produced by anything external to itself. Quod era demonstrandum. This is shown still more readily by the absurdity of the contradictory. For, if substance be produced by an external cause, the knowledge of it would depend on the knowledge of its cause, axiom 4, and, by definition 3, it would itself not be substance. Proposition 7. Existence belongs to the nature of substances. Proof. Substance cannot be produced by anything external. Corollary of Proposition 6. It must, therefore, be its own cause. That is, its essence necessarily involves existence or existence belongs to its nature. Proposition 8. Every substance is necessarily infinite. Proof. There can only be one substance with an identical attribute, and existence follows from its nature. Proposition 7. Its nature, therefore, involves existence, either as finite or infinite. It does not exist as finite, for, by definition 2, it would then be limited by something else of the same kind, which would also necessarily exist. Proposition 7. And there would be two substances with an identical attribute, which is absurd. Proposition 5. It, therefore, exists as infinite. Quod erat demonstrandum. Note 1. As finite existence involves a partial negation, and infinite existence is the absolute affirmation of the given nature, it follows, solely from Proposition 7, that every substance is necessarily infinite. Note 2. No doubt it will be difficult for those who think about things loosely, and have not been accustomed to know them by their primary causes, to comprehend the demonstration of Proposition 7. For such persons make no distinction between the modifications of substances and the substances themselves, and are ignorant of the manner in which things are produced. Hence, they may attribute to substances the beginning which they observe in natural objects. Those who are ignorant of true causes make complete confusion think that trees might talk just as well as men, that men might be formed from stones as well as from seed, and imagine that any form might be changed into any other. So also, those who confuse the two natures, divine and human, readily attribute human passions to the deity, especially so long as they do not know how passions originate in the mind. But if people would consider the nature of substance, they would have no doubt about the truth of Proposition 7. In fact, 
this proposition would be a universal axiom and accounted a truism for by substance would be understood that which is in itself and is conceived through itself that is something of which the conception requires not the conception of anything else whereas modifications exist in something external to themselves and a conception of them is formed by means of a conception of the thing in which they exist therefore we may have true ideas of non-existent modifications for although they may have no actual existence apart from the conceiving intellect yet their essence is so involved in something external to themselves that they may through it be conceived whereas the only truth substances can have external to the intellect must consist in their existence because they are conceived through themselves therefore for a person to say that he has a clear and distinct that is a true idea of a substance but that he is not sure whether such substance exists would be the same as if he said that he had a true idea but was not sure whether or no it was false a little consideration will make this plain or if any one affirmed that substance is created it would be the same as saying that a false idea was true in short the height of absurdity it must then necessarily be admitted that the existence of substance as its essence is an eternal truth and we can hence conclude by another process of reasoning that there is but one such substance i think that this may profitably be done at once and in order to proceed regularly with the demonstration we must premise one the true definition of a thing neither involves nor expresses anything beyond the nature of the thing defined from this it follows that two no definition implies or expresses a certain number of individuals inasmuch as it expresses nothing beyond the nature of the thing defined for instance the definition of a triangle expresses nothing beyond the actual nature of a triangle it does not imply any fixed number of triangles three there is necessarily for each individual existing thing a cause why it should exist four this cause of existence must either be contained in the nature and definition of the thing defined or must be postulated apart from such definition it therefore follows that if a given number of individual things exist in nature there must be some cause for the existence of exactly that number neither more nor less for example if twenty men exist in the universe for simplicity's sake i will suppose them existing simultaneously and to have had no predecessors and we want to account for the existence of these twenty men it will not be enough to show the cause of human existence in general we must also show why there are exactly twenty men neither more nor less for a cause must be assigned for the existence of each individual now this cause cannot be contained in the actual nature of men for the true definition of men does not involve any consideration of the number twenty consequently the cause for the existence of these twenty men and consequently of each of them must necessarily be sought externally to each individual hence we may lay down the absolute rule that everything which may consist of several individuals must have an external cause and as it has been shown already that existence appertains to the nature of substance existence must necessarily be included in its definition and from its definition alone existence must be deducible but from its definition as we have shown notes two and three we cannot infer the existence of several substances therefore it follows that there is only one substance of the same nature 
quod era demonstrandum. Proposition 9. The more reality or being a thing has, the greater the number of its attributes. Definition 4. Proposition 10. Each particular attribute of the one substance must be conceived through itself. Proof. An attribute is that which the intellect perceives of substance as constituting its essence, definition 4, and therefore must be conceived through itself, definition 3, quod era demonstrandum. Note. It is thus evident that, though two attributes are, in fact, conceived as distinct, that is, one without the help of the other, yet we cannot, therefore, conclude that they constitute two entities, or two different substances. For it is the nature of substance that each of its attributes is conceived through itself, inasmuch as all the attributes it has have always existed simultaneously in it, and none could be produced by any other, but each expresses the reality or being of substance. It is, then, far from an absurdity to ascribe several attributes to one substance, for nothing in nature is more clear than that each and every entity must be conceived under some attribute, and that its reality or being is in proportion to the number of its attributes expressing necessity or eternity and infinity. Consequently, it is abundantly clear that an absolutely infinite being must necessarily be defined as consisting in infinite attributes, each of which expresses a certain eternal and infinite essence. If any one now ask, by what sign shall he be able to distinguish different substances, let him read the following propositions, which show that there is but one substance in the universe, and that it is absolutely infinite, wherefore such a sign would be sought in vain. End of part 1, propositions 6 to 10.